It could be useful just to take a couple of deep breaths at the beginning. It's just an invitation, kind of a sacred marking of a transition of talking and engaging just to being together. And also to being with our experience. And as life becomes really simple, we can just feel the impact of that simplicity. There's nothing to do, nowhere to go. might even notice a bit of relief. We'll start with a little body scan meditation. Starting at the top of the head, inviting the awareness to wash down through the body bit by bit. You might feel the warmth of the head. Or the heaviness, the weight. Seeing if there's a way to invite some ease into the body. Not a demand, but a gentle invitation. Writing awareness to wash down the face. Inviting the face, the muscles to be at ease. And noticing what naturally happens when awareness connects with tension constriction.
You might notice pulsating or tingling, warmth or coolness. Inviting the neck, the shoulders into awareness. Is it possible to find this nice balance? This balance between a relaxed, easeful awareness, this relaxed and easeful awareness. It doesn't take much to be aware. So we invite a relaxed and easeful way that connects with this capacity to connect, to be aware. To feel into. Awareness feels into. Feel into the body now. Including the arms and the hands. And the torso, the back, the chest, the organs, is it possible to connect, to feel, to the sensations of the body in a relaxed and easeful way? Remembering that we're training and developing this habit of presence, this habit of mindful awareness. It's not important that we know everything. It's impossible to know all the sensations.
Just inviting a connection with the body. And we're doing that again and again and again. Just this, no preference, no need to prefer. Pleasant body experiences, no need to deny numbness or unpleasant body experiences. Just this. No preference, no need for more. Can this be okay? Biting the hips and the groin area into awareness, the trunk. No need to be afraid of anything we feel. Finding awareness to continue to wash through the bottom part of the body, the legs. the feet, Remembering to have a, to remember, remembering the body and its completeness. It's connecting with the general sense of the whole body.
body that's sitting upright, alert, relaxed. When you're ready, inviting awareness to land on the breath. Just that invitation might be enough to connect with the body that's breathing. And if it's not, you might look for the breath right beneath the nostrils or at the belly, evidence of the breath at the belly. Feeling into the breath. The in breath. The out breath. So simple. You might notice how it feels to be so simple. Remembering that there's no need to control the breath. The breath is just expressing its nature. Its movement in and out of the body is its nature. The shortness of breath the depth of breath, it's all nature. The breath is the way that it is for a reason. The breath is like this due to the causes and conditions that support the breath. Connecting and returning as often as needed. Returning to the simplicity of breathing.
It's really normal to notice some tightening as we learn to connect with the breath. This might be a sign of trying a little bit too hard. Trying to be aware of the breath. Or perhaps we notice some instinct to try to control the breath. That seems to persist. Remembering that these are just normal experiences as we learn and grow, and develop. We just go back to our really basic, simple instructions to connect, feel into with ease and relaxation. Remembering that the breath is just expressing its nature. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to nature. What a relief not to take the breath personally, but simply to care, to feel into, to be here with the breath. What a relief to simply be sensitive. And when we realize that we're no longer on the breath, it's no problem. It's the mind that jumps around, gets disinterested. It's also expressing its nature. It's just habit energy. It's not our fault. We apply the same instruction to the mind that bounces around. Just feel into the present moment. Return to the breath. Continue cultivating this habit of steadiness, of continuity of awareness. No problem, nothing to take personally.
for the last few minutes. I'll just invite the breath to be in the background. And we're not denying the truth of any experience. We're just tracking what's being known. Sound is being known. Body sensations, breath, sound again, thought, tension, breath again, and so on. Whatever is being known, no preference. Getting a sense of how awareness really has no preference. It's willing to receive anything. Take a minute to stretch your legs, move your body, even step away from your screen if you'd like to for a minute or two.
So raise your hand if anybody either tonight or somehow sometime during the last week noticed some resistance to practice like, oh, I don't really want to. I'll let you Zoomers, yeah? <laughs> yeah, like everybody in the hall raised their hand just for a reference point, right? Yeah. Practice is hard, isn't it? This is one of the things we learn right away. That it takes some... Um, it's not really so fair to say it takes some effort because it actually takes so little effort to be aware. And I can demonstrate that very simply by just asking you how much effort does it take to receive the sound of my voice? Not necessarily the words or the content, but just simply the sound. It takes so little, right? Just to receive the sound. The sound is already coming in the ears. The mind is just aware that hearing is happening, that hearing is already happening. So it's not that it takes effort to be aware, but it takes a remembering of our intentions, a remembering of the value. And often in the beginning and all the way through, really, there sensitivity just often highlights, you know, the how messy our minds are, how messy our relationships are. You know, often it's like I remember being on a retreat and for one of the first times realizing like, wow, I'm thinking all the time, right? I'm hardly ever in my body. I'm just like planning, evaluating, rehearsing, judging, condemning, like whatever. It's just incessant thinking. And so often when we start practicing, this kind of resistance can be there because even though we want to, you know, on a deep level, be in the middle of our lives, like if I were to ask everybody in the room, we would all have some response that was something like, you know, if I said, why did you come to this class? You, Because you want to be in your life, right? You want to be present. You want to be available. You want to know how to get through the difficult moments with some grace, some patience, some kindness without falling into despair or, you know, all kinds of other things. And so even though we know this is true, you know, the, the, the moment to moment experience can feel, the training can feel really difficult. And because like I said earlier, we're so used to just living in a reactive state so much of the time and getting by that training and this value, training to value sensitivity, to value intimacy, to value connection is slow and it takes a lot of remembering. Like, why am I doing this? Why do I care? So it can be good if we notice that resistance in our practice on a you know, day-to-day -day basis, whatever, just to, to, to not fight it, but just to, to remember like, oh, it doesn't take that much to be aware right now. Perhaps I could be aware of the resistance and just let that be here. Right? And then see if I can reconnect to what brought me here in the first place. And then you might even just sit down on your cushion or couch or chair, wherever you practice and just start this way without really making too many demands. Like I have to be calm. I have to be steady. I have to know the breath. I have to stay on the breath. That can be a bit too much for anybody, no matter how long we've been practicing. So you might try out this kind of relaxed way of just remembering your intentions and then seeing what naturally happens. Like I feel the resistance. It's hard being a human being. It's hard being in connection with the, the mind's habits. It's hard seeing how often the mind, you know, moves into some reactivity. And yet I really care about being in my life. I really care about showing up for the, myself and people that I love. You know, just saying that to you, sort of, I can feel the emotion that's, that's there. And I just sort of want to close my eyes and be with it. Right? And perhaps 
you know, something like that would happen for you too. Yeah, it leads us to wanna actually be still to feel and to connect and to train. And we're actually training in developing a capacity of presence, a more regular capacity of presence, right? We might call that mindful awareness or mindfulness, but we're training and developing this unflappable habit of awareness, a kind of awareness, uh, a presence, a presence and a represencing that isn't, that has no preferences. And it's more than a cognitive experience. Mindfulness actually has no preferences. It's like a mirror. The mirror is content to reflect back whatever is there, right? So a mirror doesn't care if it's beautiful or not beautiful. The mirror doesn't care if it's bright or dull. Mindful awareness is like this. Presence is like this. Sensitivity is like this. Mindfulness is this kind of unflappable capacity of the mind to just reflect back what's already here. And it, it's in the, this misunderstanding of experience that things start to get hard, right? We often misunderstand experience for something that's really personal, like it's my fault, right? We sit down to practice and we watch the mind that's flooded with thoughts and we go like, oh, this is my fault. I made this happen. What is wrong with me? Why can't I just, why can't I just follow the breath? You know, what am I doing wrong? This isn't for me. Raise your hand if you've had any of those thoughts. <laughs> yeah, well, I have too. That's how I know. <laughs> More often than I'd like to say. But this fundamental misunderstanding is that we take experience to be something that is ours to own or claim or appropriate when it's actually just a result of nature. It's actually just every experience that is being known is here due to the causes and conditions that supported it, right? It's just a cause and effect thing like, oh, anxiety arises because the conditions are right for anxiety to arise, not because it's Shelley's fault. Or thinking the proliferation of thoughts arise because the conditions are right for it to arise. And mindful awareness itself arises because the conditions are right for it to arise. Sleepiness, because the conditions are right for sleepiness. Dullness, because the conditions are right for dullness. Anger, because the conditions are right for dull anger. And so on. Like every emotion, every thought, every, every way of relating, every bit of tension, constriction in the mind, delight, joy in the mind, it all is a result of nature, right? It is not ours to own. And so it's this fundamental misunderstanding that causes us so much pain. Yet mindful awareness is just ready. Like, oh, let me just reflect back what's already here. Oh, tension is like this. Can you just feel that, not own it? Just let it be, right? It just wants to reflect this back. Anger. Mindful awareness reflects back to anger, no problem. Anger is just a movement of energy. It's just a force of nature. It's unpleasant, it's strong, right? Sometimes we get swept away by anger and we make a mess out of things, but that's more than just anger. That's our reaction to anger. That's our capacity that's, you know, our capacity that's limited due to the, uh, how, you know, mindfulness isn't that strong. Sometimes anger sweeps us off our feet and then it just takes us somewhere. But if we get good at, at being with anger, feeling, oh, this is just anger in the body, it's like this. The thoughts are like this when the heart is full of anger. And watching it, then we can see the tipping point. Oh, look at that, like lost mindfulness right there, right there, that moment. Stopped caring about being mindful. Oh, that's interesting. The habit of awareness isn't as strong as the habit of anger to sweep us off their feet, our, off, our, off our feet. So it's no problem what mindfulness notices. It's no problem what mindfulness reflects. 
Mindfulness is non-judging. So it can be sweet to um, get to know, get to get familiar with the unflappable nature of mindfulness. Of pro, you can use all these words like mindfulness, awareness, mindful awareness, present, sensitivity. And we can just use any word that helps us connect with this mirror that's available to us in any moment. <clears throat> And sometimes we can um, sometimes we can also make this leap that mindful being mindful is somehow about being aloof or disconnected, not really caring or something like that. But it's actually the opposite. When we're not so busy taking experience personally, right? Then there's or trying to hold on to this or get rid of that then there's a lot more space for care and compassion and a lot more space to be humbled by life, right? To be humbled by the force of nature that is alive within us, that is alive around us. And it becomes a lot harder to other people, right? Because we're, we're so humbled by the forces of nature, like, wow, look at this. It's hard to condemn someone else for being overcome with anxiety when I can feel the force of anxiety and the nature and what it, how it wants to move and express itself and how compelling it is, right? Or the force of anger and the reactivity, how hard it is to be with anger and, and watch myself like say things out of anger that really make, oh, make a mess out of things like, wow, sweetie, that's what happens when there's not enough mindfulness there. Look at that. It happens all over in the world, right? We can start to feel like really the space to be compassionate with each other is really, in my experience, amplified by this, this uh, practice of not taking experience personally. I don't know if Mark... Um, Mark mentioned uh, last week the the six sense fears. Did he talk a, a little bit about how experience? Stacy, you're shaking your head. Did he? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that experience can be summed up in these six basic ways, right? What we see, what we think, what we what we see, what we are uh, the five senses, and then the activity of mind, which is thinking. And so it's, it can be really useful to remember, like, as we remember not to take things personally, we're always going to take things personally, but we can keep wisdom in mind that helps us remember, like, oh, this is just thinking, right? This is not so much a Shelly here that's orchestrating the whole thing or is to blame for something or, but it's actually just thoughts being known body sensations being known, the eyes doing their job, the ears doing their job. And it's just this, what this thing I call Shelly is actually just this bundle of experience. <laughs> There's this wonderful uh, sutta in which this, this, this man, his name was Bahia, he was practicing Bahia of the Bark. He was practicing in these, he had only a bark to, like as a loincloth and he was practicing in these aesthetic ways. So limiting um, a lot of his sensory contact and he was really wise. People came to him and they asked for his advice and they sought his guidance. And he started to wonder like, oh, I wonder if I'm really one of the wisest beings, like an arahant, which is uh, a word used to describe a very wise being. And another being appeared and was like, uh, no, you're not on that path. And, but you know who is on that path? The Buddha. Now the Buddha knows a lot of stuff. So you could go and, you know, learn from the Buddha if you want. And so Bahia set off on 
went to find the Buddha and said that he walked or he somehow got to the Buddha, like walked or moved over mountain ranges and for days to try to get to the Buddha, right? Finally found the Buddha and he gets to the Buddha and he asked the Buddha for, you know, I've come a long way, please give me the teachings in brief. And so the Buddha's response was like, after all that walking, here's, or you know, we don't really actually, I, I know in my mind, I have this image of Bahia walking over mountains and like re, re, reinvesting in his intentions and, you know, all the, the same things that I was encouraging us to do, like just connect with the reason why we practice and why we want to be here and why we, I just imagine him doing that again and again and again over this mountainous terrain that he walked but we actually don't know if he walked <laughs> so anyway, the, so there's just that these scriptures were written down 400 years after the death of the buddha so we don't we don't know some of the, the details are accurate but the but the buddha you know summed up his the path in this very succinct way he said okay bahia you should train yourself like this in reference to the scene there will only be the scene in reference to the herd, only the herd. In reference to the sensed, only the sensed. In reference to the cognized, only the cognized. That is how you should train yourself. When for you there will be only the scene in reference to the scene, only the herd in reference to the herd, only the sense in reference to the sensed, only the cognized in reference to the cognized, then, Bahia, there will be no you in connection with that. When there is no you in connection with that, there is no you there. When there is no you here or there, you are neither here nor yonder nor between the two. This, just this, is the end of stress. So this very succinct way of pointing to this, what, what we've been saying, what Mark and I have both said, that in any moment, we, we often really claim experience for our own when it's just a force of nature. Yeah. And so we can start to tune into how like, wow, the eyes are just doing their job and the ears are just doing their job and the thinking mind is just doing its job. It's not actually so personal, right? But this is what the Buddha is saying here. It's not so personal, sweetie. And we, when we realize that it's not so personal, then it's not, it's not that, it's not that hard to be a human being. Right? We're just free to cultivate habits of goodness and express them in the world, right? And even a habit of goodness that's willing to connect with the, the, the mess of the mind, right? Every time we sit down and we notice the mind that's distracted or the mind that's sleepy or the mind that's full of hate or the mind that's whatever this is a beautiful moment because of that the goodness that's in the quality of presence right all that intentionality that infused this habit of awareness that showed up in this moment oh yeah look it's a beautiful moment like oh, i really care about my life i care about my life enough to cultivate this habit of no preference of allowing even this of being so kind to myself that I'm gonna allow nature to be nature right here in this moment that feels really painful. That's a beautiful moment, right? And what a gift to yourselves and to each other and to the world to be able to take that show on the road, right? To be able to see in ourselves and each other like, wow, human beings are just a mess. Oh, I care about that, right? And to not continue to act out in ways that cause harm. Such a beautiful way to live. Okay. So we have a little bit of time left. I wanted to go back to some more conversation. If you have any questions about what I just offered or um, the practice, you know, anything goes. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. There was a question in the chat from earlier. Part of the instruction uh, that was given last week was um, in practicing during the week to find a secluded place away from other people. And that also included away from pets. 
And the uh, question in the chat is why? Uh -huh, why okay. away from our pets? Great, thank you, Stacy. So I'll, we'll all attend to this question and then we have another question in the hall here. So the question, um, Stacy was reminding me that last week, Mark was um, giving some instruction to appreciate the value of seclusion, right? And, um, uh, and to find a place to practice that perhaps is even away from our pets. And so why do we have to be away from our pets is the question. And I think that the point that he was probably trying to make is this, um, is learning how to value seclusion, that the mind that's willing to be really simple, right? The mind that's willing to, to set down our responsibilities, even our social obligations, our caretaking obligations, really to do this noble and hard work of, of turning inward and just being curious about what's here. And so it's not that there's, I have pets and it's not that there's anything wrong with being with our pets. I love being with my dog. And sometimes, you know, it's good for us to learn how to have our own space too, right? So that I'm not, con I'm not acting out my neurotic habits with my dog. And so she's learning how to, um, yeah, be unpetted at times. <laughs> Yeah. And when I say acting out my neurotic habits with my dog, if I don't learn the skill of valuing seclusion, of really connecting, you know, value, being with the breath is one way to value seclusion. It's just a way of getting really simple. If I don't learn how to be really simple with life, then I'm, all, I'm only dependent on my reactive habits because there's no choice, right? We have no choice. We're just going to, we're at the whim of whatever arises in the moment. Yet, if I value seclusion and simplicity, then I learn how to I learn how to train this mind to be more stable, and then I have more capacity to respond with some skill in a moment. Right? So I think that's the essence of the point that he's trying to make. I mean, I'm guessing because I wasn't here. <laughs> I guess it's the point that I'm trying to make. How about that? So the question in the hall here is about working with intensity and um, noticing that there's sometimes it's useful to have a voice to guide the meditation or even to do some movement because it gives the mind something to do, right? Something to stay interested in, like the, the words that are coming forward or perhaps the movement of the body. But when there's silence, then the mind doesn't know what to do with that and can get really absorbed, especially into unpleasant experience, right? And then feel, feeling, yeah, yeah. And so feeling a bit trapped, right? And immobilized, right, the, with the intensity. So, so good, I'm really glad that you brought this up. Um, let's see here. So there are many, there are many skillful ways to practice, right? And I've, I introduced, two of them, I, I don't think I probably introduced them. Mark probably did a body scan and he probably did a little bit of awareness of breathing practice last week. And then he'll probably introduce, or maybe he already did uh, a more open awareness kind of practice too, right? And so doing a body scan, directing the, giving the mind an anchor, like back to the breath, these are just ways to train. And there are so many of them. And so our main job is to be responsive to our, what our own needs are and our own temperament and what's moving in our heart to give ourselves as big of a pasture to practice in as we need, right? So at sometimes the, the intensity is gonna be overwhelming. And at that point, we don't wanna try to pin it into one of the two or three skillful means that we've learned. We wanna see what's needed here, right? And so if, if there's this feeling of overwhelm, it's, and you already, I have figured this out on your own, that it can be really skillful just to open the eyes, right? We're gonna let in a little light. We're just reminding the system that we're, the whole nervous system, the heart, mind, the body, that we're okay here, right? There's no reason to freak out. Look at this, I have a body. And you might even adjust to move just to say, oh, look at that. There's no reason to freak out. And sometimes we don't even need to do all of that. Sometimes it just be like, open the eyes, let in a little bit of light, refresh the awareness, right? And then we'll take the next step. If that's not enough, okay, move a little bit. 
I'm not trapped. How do I know I'm, because I'm moving my body. It's okay, right? And this, this, so different experiences will require a different, a different response from us. Anxiety can be um, an experience that requires a, a quite a big pasture, right, to practice in. So sometimes when there's a lot of, and I've had a lot of intense anxiety in my life, so much so that I've, you know, not been able to work uh, at different points in my uh, life. And it's really humbling, can be really humbling when that kind of force, that strength of anxiety emerges like that. And, and so sometimes closing the eyes is like the absolute worst thing I could do, right? That it just, because just what you're saying, then the, the mind just gets absorbed into this very unpleasant feeling. And it feels like it, you know, there's no mindfulness there. It's just, it's just absorption into unpleasantness, right? And it's like uh, conditioning itself. So, oh, I hate this. I, you know, there's just no way to see around that. And so keeping the eyes open, allowing, inviting anxiety even to be in the background, even doing some walking practice and feeling the body, doing some ordinary household chores that were uh, still developing the skill of continuity of awareness, but we're not as still. Those can all be really, really good and useful. So don't be afraid to experiment with different ways to respond to what's moving in the heart. And to, to name directly or to um, address directly this point that you're making about how experience can, can feel more amplified than it actually is, is we might call that yogi pain. That's a word for that, right? It's sometimes when the heart, when in, in the midst of sensitivity or developing sensitivity, then we lose mindfulness or things feel more intense than they actually are. And we don't know that until we open our eyes and sort of look around and, uh, or, or something bursts that bubble, right? Like, oh, this, oh, wait a minute, right? It's not, it's not that there, but, but we have to figure that out. So if there's this feeling of intensity of any kind and it feels more amplified and there's even a little voice of wisdom in the back that goes like, oh, I don't, I don't know if my back hurts actually this bad. I wonder, it's weird that it hurts this bad now, but it didn't hurt this bad like 15 minutes ago, right? Or when I open my eyes, you know, it hurts a little bit less. That's so weird, right? So what we're, we can learn is that the mind is engaged with the body, that there's mind pain and body pain, and that there's in, this interplay that's happening. And that's a really good thing to learn because if there's... In, like back pain, for example, or knee pain, and we learn that the part of the feeling of pain is actually what we feel in the mind and not in the body, then we can have, again, we can train and we can have some say over how we support the mind's relationship to pain, right? So the same is true for emotional pain, like anger or grief or anxiety or any other feeling of despair, intense feeling that sometimes we need to just, um, we need to see the, that the relationship is actually contributing to the feeling of in intensity itself, right? So we can ask, is there a different way of relating to this pain? Do I have to like grin and bear it or push through it? Because that might be a relationship that's a, um, amplifying it even more. And maybe we need, what we need is the instruction to soften or back off or not push or not fight. Right, remember that nobody's forcing me to be here. Look at this, I could move, I could even stand up, right? I could walk out the, of the room, I could, you know, any of these things that help the system settle down a little bit is good. Is that supportive? Yeah. And this can be a really important um, thing to remember if, uh, if what we feel is like old memories or traumatic memories coming up or the body remembers some past trauma that's coming to the fore, we, we need a huge pasture and a lot of care to find our way through that right? and to not, not try to force, force anything. So seclusion, Awareness of breathing is just one, one skillful means. There are so many of them. Okay, friends, it is, I talked too long and now we're over by three minutes. I'll ask Mark to give you back your three minutes next week. How about that? <laughs>
Thank you so much for um, allowing me to be here with you. It's fun and obviously um, I get a little enthused by the teachings and carried away sometimes. So I apologize for keeping you a little bit late. But uh, yeah, wishing you all well and hopefully we'll see you back in a couple weeks.